Thank you so much, and good morning. Well, we're turning in our Bibles now to Acts, Acts chapter 16. We're going to be considering today true versus false spiritualities found in this passage. And as you're turning there, I thought I'd pause. Let's take a look back over last week, get our bearings, a sense of where we were and where we are, so we can figure out where we need to be. And the picture that you see upon the screen is the picture of Paul as he would have been ministering at the place of the riverside. The riverside. Family stood there, gazed, pondered. It's the place where the Apostle Paul would have shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to Lydia and her household. God opened the heart of Lydia. As Paul opened the gospel to Lydia, God opened the heart of Lydia. And the result was there was this penetration of the gospel into her heart, her mind, and her soul. The result was that we see in this passage the first conversion on the continent of Europe. First believer, with more to come. Because out of this, of course, her entire household came to saving faith. But what we want to see is that with true spirituality, there will be a counterfeit. There is a false spirituality. And just as there is an advancement of the gospel, whether it be on to a continent or within a household, likewise, there will be a counteroffensive, a counterattack. There will be resistance whenever the gospel goes forth. We see it, for example, whenever something of significance occurs, where someone shares faith in Jesus Christ, the evil one will then go on the counteroffensive. Take, for example, of course, when Jesus was affirmed at his baptism as being the Son of God, what happened? He was immediately taken out into the wilderness to be tempted of the evil one. So whenever there is an advancement on one hand, Expect an attack on the other hand, and that leads us now to what's about to take place where there is a counteroffensive that begins to unfold, albeit through subterfuge, subtleties. You pick it up now with me, don't you, in verse 16. Because of the 16th chapter you and I are now reading, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination, and brought her own owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of that very hour. You see. Keep going. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, and they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened you see, their feet in the stocks. So we're going to be looking at these verses this morning. We're going to try to understand how this relates to modern day life. I want you to be thinking with me now, true versus false spiritualities. I want you to be thinking advancement and counteroffensives. 
whether it be globally or even in your own personal experiences, when you've shared the gospel, say, with a family member, co-worker, someone at work, the evil one does not want to give up ground as we look to the Lord now in prayer. Our Father, what we're doing now is we are examining your word as we're examining our hearts. We want all the time to be able to be true to your word. It's inerrant. It is without error in the originals. It's eternal, yet ever so contemporary. We build a bridge from the days of Paul and to the way in which we live life in 2020. We want to be able to see how the past and the present relate to the future. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, as stated in the Bible, the beginning and the end. And if it's not eternal, it's got to be out of date. So we're going to deal with the eternal, press it into the contemporary, wanting it to be alive in our hearts as we think your thoughts for these days in which we live. Warm these hearts, engage these minds, Shape these wills, whether it be present, physically, or via live stream YouTube. We've come here now to see Jesus, him only. Praying these things still again now in Jesus' name. Amen. The military strategist, Napoleon Bonaparte, illustrated the importance of the counterattack with these words. The greatest danger occurs at the moment of victory. That's when somebody lets their shield down. That's when people become vulnerable. It's after those great victories, after those great successes, those mountaintop experiences that you've got to wait and await and be aware of the descent into the valley of life. We want to think about that this morning as we're looking very carefully now at these verses. Something significant's happened there in Greece. The evil one realizes now that the Apostle Paul has been a carrier. He has transmitted the gospel from the lands of Israel now onto the continent of Europe. Lydia, prominent woman there. She's an immigrant, comes from what we now know as modern day Turkey. Positioned well, however, within Philippi to be able to set up a strategy for Paul to begin to build a momentum for the gospel to go forth. But you want to expect now the counterattack. What you want to expect is counterfeits. And so what I want to do now this morning is to simply draw two significant expectations that believers ought to have when they have to deal with true versus false spiritualities. They're trying to figure out, how do I communicate this in this ever-confusing, changing world in which we live? The first expectation comes out of verses 16 through 18. It's going to appear on the screen. That as the gospel of Jesus Christ advances... Expect counteroffenses, or some would call it counteroffensives, beginning with spiritual oppression. Beginning with spiritual oppression, that's exactly what's beginning to unfold here in these verses. Now, I want you to see how the evil one has woven in the whole matter of timing into this story. Timing. Lydia has just received Jesus Christ as her Lord, as her Savior as has the household. Paul, Silas, Timothy, Luke, they've gone to hang out, spend the night there in Lydia's household. Enjoyed some grilled octopus. Get that you know in Greece, and it is good. In the morning when they got up, most likely some Greek yogurt. And once they had their Greek yogurt, they're going to get ready to make their move. They're going to head out towards the riverside once again. 
They've got their saganaki in hand, which is fried cheese. And as they're making their way, it's not in, the, it's not in Acts 16, by the way. That's Highlander 316. As we were going to the place of prayer, notice the timing here. Notice the setting here. Notice what's going on here, the place of prayer. We're met by a slave girl. Now, pause again. You and I have been spotting how the brilliant physician Luke, who wrote volume one, the Gospel of Luke, volume two, the book of Acts, has positioned women in both consistent ways and in comparative ways. There's Mary and Elizabeth, and then there's Anna, of course, in the opening chapters of Luke. Ah, there's that busy Martha trying to do good in her household, but there's Mary at the feet of Jesus who understood what's really good, being at the feet of Jesus. You make your way onwards into the book of Acts. There's Lydia. She's at the riverside. But now the evil one is chosen to use a slave girl because if he can position this woman to be a counterfeit to Lydia among those that are growing in their faith in Jesus Christ, then the moment Lydia begins to share her testimony, the evil one, via the slave girl, could say, yeah, but, and offer an alternative, you see. We're in Greece, you know. We're in Philippi. It's a Romanized town. Octavius, Mark Antony, fought against Cassius and Brutus in the Battle of Philippi. One. The result was, though, that this was a destination for retired soldiers to come and set up a place for the latter years of their lives. And so we're going to the place of prayer because there's really no synagogue to be found. We're met by a slave girl. You saw Lydia last week. Now we see the slave girl this week. What's going on? You're going to see truth. You're going to see true spirituality versus false spirituality in both subtle ways and overt ways as well. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination brought her owners, much gained by fortune-telling. And you say, Gar, the spirit of divination, can you you draw it out a little bit? Can you develop it? Can we think this through just a tad? Well, yeah. The spirit of divination here means literally from the Greek, she had a Pythian spirit, or literally... She had a spirit of python. Python is a snake. Immediately you go to Genesis and you think about the story that's told there in the opening chapters. But bear in mind, the evil one is a counterfeiter. I want you now, because we are touring Greece, we're following in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, I want you to ask our tour guide, Rainey, would, would you mind if we head off to Delphi? Let's do it. So we make our way to Delphi. There's a story there. You see Apollo, Delph, temple at Delphi. Apollo, one of the Greek gods in mythology, Apollo was the one who, in order to be able to secure Delphi as being the center of communicating spirituality, slayed a python. Thus it was known as Pythonus. It was viewed as the center of the earth. And that became the basis by which the oracles of Delphi were viewed throughout Greece as a means of offering heightened spirituality with regard to the Greek gods that had so-called reigned over the Greek land. 
Oh, the Romans came along and they Romanized the Greek gods. Zeus, Jupiter. But what now Apostle Paul is going to have to do is to be able to penetrate the false spiritualities of Europe now with the true spirituality, as Francis Schaeffer would have put it. True spirituality based upon the biblical truth that God has sent forth his son Jesus to die on a cross to save us from our sins and three days later be raised from the dead. But meanwhile, this woman who has the authentic spirit, Lydia, is waiting for Paul, but Paul is being harassed by a woman with the spirit of Python In other words, she is declaring oracles. She is mimicking the oracles from Delphi. You see, this needs to be understood historically to get a better sense of what's going on scripturally. Back to the text. She's got the spirit of Python. It's brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. People have this vested interest in wanting to know as much as possible about the future. Thus the crave, you see, for fortune-telling, even in the now of today. Well, she's following Paul. She's harassing Paul. And she is vocalizing She's crying out. And notice, notice what she says. Loud voice. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Face value. You say to yourself, sounds good. Sounds like she is proclaiming the gospel. Question. But is she? Just who is this most high God anyways that she's proclaiming? After all, the Greeks and the Romans had their pantheons. You have your Jupiter, you have your Zeus. Who is this that she is proclaiming? And could the evil one possibly be using an up-to-date version of just as he would utilize Judas among the 12 in Israel, now he will utilize this slave girl to hang out with Lydia and her household and then ponder this. The evil one loves to float 1% lie on 99% truth and maybe a day later 2% lie on 98% truth, and so on, as assimilation takes place via spiritualities. Now, that's why we go verse by verse. That's why we deal with the integrity of God's word, the authority of God's word. This is not a playground, this is a battleground. And so what we've got to do is to understand that there are both overt and covert operations that take place. And the evil one wants us to begin to think that what we are seeing is what we ought to be seeing. And what we're hearing, we ought to be hearing when she is crying out, these men are servants. Now, I want you to ponder this. She has identified them but she does not identify with them. And where does she get such spiritual insights anyways? Most high God. And furthermore, she's proclaiming to you the way of salvation. But because we're in Greece... we open up our Greek New Testament and find out that literally... There is no the the there. It is a way of salvation, which is what was continuously proclaimed at Delphi, so this would have fit in very naturally. The spirit of Python is simply the echo of what was being proclaimed in Delphi itself, which was part of Greece. 
Oh, she's got a way of salvation, but bring it to 2020. Everybody's got a plan of salvation. It might be materialistic. It might be a political form of salvation. It might be a material form of salvation. It might be a business form of salvation. But the question is, what's the ultimate salvation plan? And can we trust appearances when we ought to be pursuing realities? It was the 1936 Olympics. They were to be held in Berlin, Nazified Germany. And because of that regime's anti-Semitic policies, some in Great Britain, France, U.S., wanted to boycott the games, but the games went on. And now the rest of the story. Interestingly, there were several Jews among the German athletes. Captain Fiesner was a Jew and was in charge of erecting and managing the Olympic Village. Anti-Semitic posters along the highways were taken down. News reporters saw no notices barring Jews from settings. An anti-Jewish newspaper disappeared from the newsstands in Berlin. And as visitors flocked into Berlin, they were welcomed enthusiastically. And they left wondering, and speaking of wonderful, favorable impressions of Hitler's Reich. But you see, it was all window dressing. Hitler at this point was using a covert operation, subterfuge, subtleties creating appearances while disguising realities. On the streets of Greece was a Delphi moment, and now the question is, can one who so identifies with true spirituality, the Apostle Paul, be able to penetrate and discern and distinguish the distortions that come from false spirituality? And if so, how does he go about doing it? You're up to verse 18. This she just, she kept doing for many days. She's harassing him. And Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of here. And it came out. That very hour. A few observations. Number one, Paul spoke directly to the demon, not to the girl. This is not a power encounter, this is a truth encounter. I remember studying under Neil Anderson in my doctoral program. And he had just come back from India, and he was talking about those who are attempting to utilize power encounters when dealing with false spiritualities. And he challenged them to rethink their methodology and use truth encounters and communicate biblical truth, stating in the name of the Lord. He spoke directly to the demon, not the girl, Paul. But secondly, he commanded it to come out of her. He didn't ask. No petitions here, no requests. And thirdly, he drew on the power of Jesus' name. Did you see it there? Not on his own power. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice. Your people cry out, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O Lord. But what's fascinating about the Spirit of Python is that the Spirit of Python did not utilize a name. when this woman was making her utterances. 
she was simply crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God. She didn't identify the Most High God. Now, I would argue that in this era where we see rapid mobility, heightened spirituality, combined with advanced technology, spiritualities can be communicated rapidly. And what we need to do, as Francis Schaeffer, again in his book, True Spirituality, advocated, we've got to be able to distinguish between true versus false spiritualities and be able to communicate this effectively because the evil one does not want to be exposed. He operates on the basis of covert operations primarily, like he did in the Garden of Eden when he is described as inhabiting the serpent of old and again, There's that serpent at Delphi that's alluded to that we need to, we need to understand what's going on. We need to be wise, not gullible in the times in which we live. Yahweh, Yahweh, the covenantal name for God, you see. We love to shout your name. O oh Lord. Now, once you've grasped what we've got here, then you can nod in approval with that brilliant professor, Merrill Unger, a THD from Dallas, PhD from Johns Hopkins, wrote Her commendation of Paul and Silas as servants of the Most High God demonstrates the subtlety of Satan in gaining followers for later deception. The incident shows how Satan frequently parades as an angel of light, especially under the guise of alleged religiosity. So let me ask you, are you surprised when Paul woke up in the morning, early stage of this advancement, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden he faces a counteroffensive. But isn't that exactly what Luke describes in volume one of his writings pertaining to Jesus? When Jesus, after having calmed the Galilean Sea with disciples present, sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, And I remember being on a boat as we were nearing Galilee, looking out, and I'm saying to myself, that's where Hezbollah now is. They are infiltrating the West Bank. Very same setting where in Luke chapter 8, verse 27, when Jesus stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. He would then pose this question, Jesus, Son of the Most High, God, I beg you, do not torment me. And you and I know the rest of the story. Jesus cast the demons into the swine, which makes you wonder, of course, what on earth were men doing raising swine in Israel? You see. Jesus saw counterfeit and brought reality. And what you and I have to do is to spot counterfeit, bring reality. So beginning with spiritual oppression in verses 16 through 18, second of all, as the gospel of Jesus Christ advances, expect counteroffenses, or for some counteroffensives, continuing with social opposition. Starts with spiritual oppression, it's covid might be just 1% lie and 99% truth. But there's more to come. There's a stratagem. So you pick it up now in verse 19. And in verse 19, you and I are told these words, when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. Pause. Now, 
This setting was not a business setting, the setting of Philippi. It was a military setting by and large, retired military personnel. So when you had a business such as a slave girl involved in fortune telling, you had a monopoly. And now what we have is a Teddy Roosevelt moment. He breaks up the monopoly. It's as if now everything has been fragmented. And so what are they going to do? When the, her owners saw their hope of gain was gone because where there is gain in terms of gospel advancement, there is loss in terms of resistance. They're going to have to do something, another counteroffensive. They're going to adjust strategies. In reality, this is the evil one now, attempting to furthermore keep the gospel from going forth. They seized Paul, Silas dragged them. It's a very forceful word you see in the original language. Dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. So it's got our bearings. We need a picture of Philippi, don't we? Okay. So as it appears on the screen, I want you to see here, you've walked with me around here. Rainy has been our guide. She's a good one, as I mentioned last week. And she's got her Greek New Testament open. And as she pauses from site to site, we're taking in what we're seeing here. But notice very carefully with me what's up here. What we see up here also appears on the next screen, if that could be shown, the next slide, if you will. This is known as the Agora in Philippi. You say Agora? What's that guy? The Agora in Philippi was the same as the Roman Forum in Rome or the souks in Jerusalem. It's where there was bartering, negotiating. You want a bag of lemons, you go to the Agora, you see. You want to be able to get your fresh yogurt for the morning, you go to the Agora, you see, that kind of thing. And if you want your grilled octopus, mm, there's the place to go, you see. Now, The Agora then was the place not only where people would come to get their groceries and the likes, but all the more so at the edge of the Agora, the marketplace, that's where you would have your courthouse setting. This is where you'd have your magistrates. This is where you'd have the police. This is where the judicial system was established. So if there were any tensions, you would go to the edge of the Agora. And that's now what's happening here. Because you're up to the end of verse 19. You're launching into verse 20. Back to the text. When they brought them to the magistrates. Look at what they said. These men are Jews. Camp on it. They didn't say these men are Christians. There's anti Semitism lurking here. Now, the first Christians were Jews in the book of Acts. So these are Jewish Christians, Christian Jews. But now what the evil one is doing, because anti-Semitism has always been part of his master plan, rather the fir- if not the first coming, then certainly the second coming. Old Testament, think of Haman in the book of Esther. And think of the ways in which the Jews were persecuted. Think of, again, Hitler during World War II. Now then, what we find, because there was no synagogue to be found in Philippi, this is probably not a place for Jews to feel comfortable. These men are Jews. They're disturbing our city. They are advancing our customs. In other words, we're traditionalists. And and they they are affecting our traditions. They're not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. This is now another counterattack. There will not be due process of law. Just as in the Roman lack of due process of law with Jesus in Luke's volume 1, so likewise no due process 
for a law regarding Paul and Silas in Book 2 in Philippi, this Romanized colony. The crowd joined in on attacking them. Nobody intervenes. The magistrates tore their garments off them, gave orders to beat them with rods. In other words, now we've gone from legal neglect to physical suffering. And it keeps unfolding in these pages as the evil one is doing his very best to be able to produce a, a counteroffensive to keep the gospel from going forth, maybe we can incarcerate Paul and Silas, let the slave girl hang out with Lydia, and diminish the influence. Back to World War II. One of the most famous, if not most famous of all counteroffenses in history it took place in 1944. Battle of the Bulge. A counteroffensive would occur under the leadership of Hitler. It seemed as though Europe was now going to tilt the Allies' way, but he made one more attempt. Four panzer divisions were moved with utmost secrecy, covert operation, reinforcing the infantry of the Nazi regime. In the strategic setting, Mortain was briefly recaptured. It looked as though all of a sudden the Nazis were going to begin to get the upper hand, but then August 7th, General Eisenhower working with Patton in conjunction offered a counter-offensive to the counter-offensive. And finally, when the mist began to lift, there was this dramatic change. Waves of Allied fighter bombers attacked the Nazi armored columns, firing guns, rockets. The Nazi divisions pinned down, lost more than 150 tanks in space of just a few hours. And by the evening, it was clear that their attack had failed at Mortain. Hitler had his final throw of the dice, as one historian put it in Normandy, and he lost. Beware of counter-offensives. They happen globally. They happen nationally. They happen on the streets of a nation, and they happen at the doorsteps of family units, and in the settings in which we work, we have to be able to distinguish between true and false spiritualities. This world is not a playground, it's a battleground. And so if he couldn't use what you and I would call spiritual oppression to keep Paul from advancing the gospel, he'll use social opposition in 19 through 24, having him incarcerated. So he orders the jailer to keep them safely after many blows here in verse 23, many blows upon them, throws them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. You're up to verse 24. And having received this order, he didn't merely put them into the prison. He put them into the, into the inner prison, the very core of the prison. The word fastened carried with it the idea of painful tightening their feet in the stocks, where they would have been positioned in such a way that when they attempted to sleep, they would not sleep lying down. They would have to sleep upright. They would endure their persecution. How well would they do? We'll find out next week. But you know, in Rome, archaeologists dug the remains of a school for imperial pages and found a picture dating from the third century and shows a boy standing, his hand raised, worshiping the Lord. He's making the sign of the cross. And underneath are these words, Alexamas worships his Lord. 
And then a second inscription. Alexamas is faithful. Because evidently the young man who was a Christian was being mocked by his schoolmates for his faithful witness. But we are told he was faithful among the faithless. And so you have it. Where there is advancement, there are counteroffensives. As Napoleon Bonaparte put it, the greatest danger occurs at the moment of victory. But Jesus gets the upper hand. Because not only did Jesus utter the words, it is finished on the cross. But three days later, God raised him from the dead. Let's stand together. So, Father, we're going verse by verse. This will not be a naive congregation, whether it be physically present or via live stream. We've got to understand that we have to look at life holistically, not merely being drawn into appearances and forsaking realities. So, Lord, give us extraordinary discernment to do what Schaefer encouraged us to do, to distinguish between true and false spiritualities, articulate true spirituality, and share the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who need to know of the one who died for our sins and three days later was raised from the grave. We need to put our faith exclusively in Christ alone. Thank you for being our God, Yahweh. And for this, we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name.